While some of the greatest American houses of all time have been lost to the wrecking ball, others have disappeared in plain sight, swallowed whole by their surroundings. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. To better understand why the Harry Payne Bingham house went from a 35-room Italian palazzo-style mansion to whatever this is, we need to go back in time. In 1887, Harry Payne Bingham was born into an incredibly wealthy Cleveland family. He was closely related to the very people who held power in this country, the politically elite Paynes and the Secretary of the Navy, William Collins Whitney. His whole life was planned out from start to finish. While attending Yale, he roomed with the president's son, and after graduating, his family purchased him a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. Now that his professional life had officially started, he was expected to build an imposing mansion. At this time, in the early 1900s, Cleveland was thriving. It was known as the Paris of the Midwest, and it gained that nickname for a good reason. All along Euclid Avenue, millionaires, who would be considered billionaires today, built ornate mansions. The streets were lined with trees framing the perfectly manicured gardens of the rich and famous, and among the likes of the Rockefellers, Henry would leave his own mark on Cleveland. In 1916, construction started on his 35-room mansion set between East Boulevard and Magnolia Drive, one of the most desirable locations in the world at the time. He hired the famed architecture firm of Walker & Gillette to create a stately and refined mansion in the Italian Palazzo style using only the finest materials available. From the house, lawns reach out between stone balustrade with formal gardens surrounding it on all sides. Of course, this is all before this happened to it. As we make our way below the porte cochere and enter the home, we will see a mix of historic and color photos to really bring the mansion back to life. First, we arrive in the stair hall, flanked by stone columns and old-growth wood adorning the ceiling. This cavernous space terminates in the three-story groin vault soaring overhead, while antique European tapestries decorate the walls. While it retains most of these features today, the stair hall leaves us wondering why it appears almost simple by comparison. From here we can continue into the library, where form meets function with bookcases supporting the groin vaulted ceiling. Then we come across the dining room, breathing a sigh of relief at its preserved details. From antique furnishings to European tapestries glowing in the light of a crystal chandelier, we can now imagine the grandeur of its glory years. Looking up, the coffered ceiling is decorated in intricate relief work and complemented by bold and delicate hand stenciling. The drawing room radiates golden hues as we make our way from one end to the other. The ceiling appears almost dull until we take the time to really look at it. As our eyes focus, we find murals framed by bands of decorative millwork with hand stenciled flowers and vines, gracefully and subtly wisping about. Next, we will discover the conservatory, flooded by natural light pouring across the mosaic tile floor and reflecting towards the groin vault overhead. In full color, this space would have been dazzling in its prime. Every tiny detail, carried through bands of hand stenciling, creates a cohesive palette. The stonework in this room continues with whimsy in the column's capitals, surely, the house can only get better from here. Let's mosey into the connecting pavilion and keep exploring. On second thought, let's turn around and go back in time to see the reading room clad with marble walls and accompanied by the trickling sounds of an indoor fountain. Even the children's playroom was set to a grand scale and finished out with murals adorning the walls. So what happened to this grand estate? During the time of its construction from 1916 to 1919, Harry inherited a fortune from his uncle Colonel Oliver Payne. His inheritance included his uncle's massive estate overlooking the Hudson River in New York, which he promptly moved to. He never did end up moving into his Cleveland mansion. Instead, he chose to finish it and sell it in 1920. It was purchased by one of Cleveland's wealthiest widows, Mrs. Corley Walker Hanna, who used it as her primary residence, enjoying its many opulent rooms for the rest of her life. When she passed away, her son donated the Bingham Hanna House to the Western Reserve Historical Society, remaining very much intact with very few changes being made to the interior or exterior. But over the years, as Western Reserve not only grew but thrived, the organization required more space. Instead of constructing a new building, portions of the house were demolished and replaced by massive additions, even pouring into one of the neighboring mansions. Western Reserve is said to have one of the largest collections of books and artwork of any historical society, which is perhaps why so much more space was needed but many people over the years have criticized the historical and architectural integrity of its additions, and though the work they do is important in providing an invaluable resource for Cleveland's history and beyond, I'll pass the question off to you. Is this okay? Is it acceptable to destroy historic architecture in the name of preservation? 
Should the additions be undone and the building restored? Or maybe this was the best option for retaining the home's architectural integrity? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.